25 years ago at St. Timothy's Church in Mountain View, California, in California's Silicon Valley, there was a course taught entitled The Prophetic Imagination. It was about the strain of Old Testament prophecy, about the voice of prophets, about their role, often unpopular, in their own time to be spokespeople for God. And one of the exercises in the course, The Prophetic Imagination, was taking the newspaper from that particular morning and unprepared, looking at the stories in it and looking for the presence of God. Now, that was fairly easy when we were reading the story about the Boy Scout troop that volunteered at the soup kitchen. Okay, there's the presence of God. It was more challenging when we were reading the story about the armed bank robbery. But the insistence of that class and the thing that we insist on as the people of God in this time is that God's presence is constant. If we did that same exercise this week, it would feel challenging. Where is the presence of God when 19 third and fourth graders are killed in their classrooms along with two teachers? Where is the presence of God two weeks ago when individuals just doing their shopping at the grocery store are killed in Buffalo, New York. And this is not isolated to these two heartbreaking occurrences in the news cycle just over the last two weeks. It seems as though, and we often remark, that the only news that's reported is bad news. And so asking the question, or even having the audacity to suggest that we might find the presence of God in the newspaper, seems to be a bold claim at least. And yet, we are followers of the one who came into the world to proclaim that God's love for humanity was ever-present and everlasting. And so, when our hearts are particularly shattered in a week like this past week, it can become very easy to slip into that place of hopelessness, of unrecoverable despair, of resignation, and the wondering, God, are you really with us? On Friday evening, a handful of people and I gathered in this sanctuary space for a vigil in memory of those who were killed in these shootings in these last two weeks. Uvalde and Buffalo made the most headlines, but there were more than that, as you may well know. And I invited those who were present to share why it was important for them to have come that night. And one of them said that she had come for the express reason that she did not want to give in to this heavy feeling that this is just the way the world is and there's nothing that's going to change it. It was a bold confession. And I am all too aware that for many people, the reality of violence in society feels too pervasive and too ingrained in our culture and that to try to resist against it or to speak out in ways that call for change feels like energy that is wasted. Who am I? as one person who can make a difference 
in the face of such seemingly intractable and entrenched realities. And I wonder what would have happened if the one whom we call Lord and Savior had come into the world and taken a survey of the culture of his time and the religious norms and the entrenched interests of power and privilege and said, you know what? Beam me up, Scotty. I can't turn the tide of this place. Instead, what we read about in the Gospels is again and again and again, he is confronting that which is unjust, that which is abusive, and that which denies the fullness of life. And he pays a great price. We know the end of the story. Those in Jesus' time did not know the end of the story, even though he told them pretty plainly what was going to happen. And yet he was willing to go to that place that cost him his life to say, this is wrong. And I am not going to be quiet about what is wrong. And so I was thinking about other occasions in our more recent history, other occasions in which things that we now know in the present were not known at the time. Things that some people might even take for granted, but during the struggle may have seemed as though they were very long odds. What must it have been like for early advocates in a thoroughly patriarchal culture of this very United States to suggest audaciously that women should be able to vote like men in the face of all of the arguments that were given belittling Oh, women aren't smart enough. They don't understand the affairs of society. You better leave that important business to men. And yet their voices continued, continued to press. This is not right. It may not be allowed to stay the way that it is. And it wasn't a quick turnaround. But the constitutional amendment was eventually passed. And universal suffrage was put into law. And that must have been a wonderfully celebratory day, but it was a day that was long in coming. What must it have been like for Tabo and Becky and Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and others who at great personal cost resisted against the scourge of apartheid in South Africa when there had been such a long legacy from even before the Boer Wars in that country of direct and cruel abuse of black South Africans to preserve the privilege of white South Africans. What must it have been like in all of those years in which the entrenched powers of apartheid seemed unassailable. And then at some point, F.W. de Klerk, the president of the country in partnership with Nelson Mandela, who had served over two decades in prison for having the audacity to resist against that, when he was released and they forged this partnership to at least legally abolish the system of apartheid. What must it have been like for the people in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War that was supposed to have brought slavery to an end and if not equality, at least freedom and opportunity for black Americans to see a series of Jim Crow laws go into effect and where it wouldn't be for a hundred years from 1865 to 1965's passage of the Civil Rights Act for there to be some kind of legal redress 
for what was so clearly wrong in this culture. And so it can be a long road. It can be a hard road. It can feel like a hopeless road. But one of the things in this present time when we are hurting this week in the aftermath of, it is heartbreaking to say, another senseless tragedy. What is it that we, as people of conscience, but at least as importantly, and I would argue more importantly, as followers of Christ, what is it that we are called to do in response? And I have become convicted over long years after having been a member of Trinity Episcopal Church in Newtown, Connecticut 10 years ago and a school chaplain at Worcester School in Danbury who led a vigil service on the evening of December 14th, 2012 for the children who were killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School. I have become convinced that there is two parts of a Christian response. And you don't have to agree with me. And some of you will not. And that's a part of the great thing about our working out of our faith in the Episcopal Church. Is that we are a church of conscience, but not a church that calls for unanimous positions on things of faith. But what we are called to do is engage them prayerfully and thoughtfully and with deep conscience. And so I've become convinced that there are two parts to a response to violence that robs the lives of people who in no way deserve to have their lives stolen. And the first part is we have to stop treating those who disagree with us as crazy. You don't like it when it's done to you. I don't respond well when it's done to me. And yet there are times again and again and again when other people, and it's easy to blame them, right? Because they're always the crazy ones. We're the sane ones. We're the righteous ones. We're the thoughtful ones. They're the ones who are off the rails. But when other people already know what's in your heart and have decided that you're an idiot, but sometimes we do that too. Sometimes we look at the convictions and the ideology of the other and we write them off. They don't even deserve to be engaged with because they're crazy. And there is some really, really good things that come out of having an attitude like that. One of the good things is increased television ratings. It's really, really good for increased TV ratings. Go for the jugular. Build an audience that is so polarized that they will lap up whatever you say, especially the more that you demonize the other. Great for TV ratings. Really, really good for social media engagement statistics. Put those kinds of messages in front of people in social media forums and watch them tear each other apart and watch the advertising revenue come in. But it's not really good for a healthy society. Abraham Lincoln was reported to have said on one occasion in the midst of the anguish of the Civil War years, I do not like that man. I must get to know him better. I do not like that man. I must get to know him better. And we would do well by doing the same thing with one another. Second part that I am convinced about is that when you know what the instrument of harm is, and we don't do anything possible to prevent its causing harm that we share in the harm. Now, this is where a priest on a Sunday morning preaching a sermon is going to go into politics and people are going to get mad. 
And to that discomfort, I would say this. If we take every single thing that is brought up for debate in the halls of Congress and in state legislators and even in town hall meeting rooms, and we label that political, and we then say that shalt not be dealt with in church, then what we are saying is all things in our society that are kicked around by our elected leaders are outside the domain of our faith. And I wonder if we really want to say that. I wonder if we want to reflexively allow others to remove from any possibility of prayerful and heartfelt, faith-based, scripture-addressed consideration when lives are at stake. And so there are things that can be done. And you have thought about this. And you have heard others talk about it. And you have likely already come to conclusions about how available guns should be in retail establishments, online, whether or not background checks should be done universally for all people. You've thought about this. You have positions on this. And what I would ask you this morning is, have the positions that you have come to involved your Christian faith? Have you been prayerful? Have you sought out in Scripture? Have you asked yourself, what would the character of God represented in the person of Christ have to say about this place that we are in and the prevalence of weapons of mass killing in our culture? Because that's our business. We elect leaders to deliberate legislation and that's their business. But our business as the people of God is to ask the questions of God and to ask when Jesus is gathered with his closest disciples and his opponents come to arrest him and they step forward and they try to seize him and one of his closest friends takes out his sword and gets ready to fight and Jesus says put away your sword what does that mean about the example of Christ. And so there is action to be taken. And I pray that you would not shrink back or be shy from engaging in places of robust consideration about the responsibility that we have as people of a society together, not as the righteous and the idiots, not as the enlightened and the ignorant but as people together who can agree that we care about third graders and fourth graders and teachers in their classroom. Not a single person that I have met have said, eh, that doesn't matter. And I have sat in front of people in the aftermath of the Newtown shootings whose lives were shattered and it is not adequate to say to people in that place of pain, well, you know, we're just gonna agree to disagree. Your kids are dead, but there's nothing we can do. That's inadequate. We cannot say that. And so these things are a Christian response, and that is our business as people of God in Christ to make a Christian response in this world for that which promotes life. If we were going to do that exercise from the course of the prophetic imagination and ask ourselves the question, where is God today? I would argue vehemently 
that God is wherever there are people facing down a system that enables the killing of innocents. That is anathema to God. And whatever it is that is within the power of our voices and our actions, it is the very least that we can do by way of response to others who are hurting and who are in pain. Because as our scriptures tell us, when one member of the body is injured, all members of the body suffer. So let us be moved. Let us not shrink back from what it feels like to be in such daunting circumstances. But instead, let us take the agency and the power that is given to us in our own lives, not only ours alone as human beings of goodwill and good conscience, but that is ours as the people of God through the Holy Spirit who calls us to promote and preserve all life. Amen.